So Imam al-Ghazali, within the Nizamiya school, confronted both sects. And as such, people started flocking to this school and started studying. A revival happened. And Nizam al-Mulk encouraged scholarship. Everywhere started giving them support and started spreading them, started confronting the Ismaili movement on the ideological plane. But then the unexpected happened. Another turn in events. Nizam al-Mulk himself. This person who established al-Madrasa Nizamiya, who dares and fight against the Ismaili movement. One day, Nizam al-Mulk, somebody approaches him. And Nizam al-Mulk thinks that he wants to complain or something. He approaches him. And this is one of the assassins dressed as a worshipper. They thought he's a worshipper. A person that worshipped Allah for a long time. As Nizam al-Mulk approaches him, he gets a poisonous dagger. And he stabs Nizam al-Mulk, the assassins. The last words Nizam al-Mulk says, Don't kill my murderer. I pardoned him. La ilaha illallah. And this great figure, Nizam al-Mulk, dies. When Nizam al-Mulk dies, it was only a few months after which this Seljuk empire or Seljuk state actually broke down. Instead of being one, it broke into five different pieces. Oy, everyone had a state. One was in Iran. One, you know, had Baghdad. The other one, Asia Minor. And the other one was situated in Damascus. Dimashq. Damascus, the capital of Sham, another one in Halab. At this time, Sham, this area, split. And it split, as we said before, to 22 different small nations. That was the situation at which the Crusades happened. And next, we're going to discuss that. That was what's going on in the Muslim world at the times of the Crusade. In Europe, now we switch a little bit, things were having a different turn. Europe at this point, there was two major groups, if you will. One, the Orthodox Christians, the, the Byzantian Empire. Those are the, the Romans, if you will. You know the Romans? This is what's left of the Roman Empire, the eastern part of it. Those are Orthodox Christians. Their capital is modern-day Istanbul or Constantinia. And they were directly in contact with the Seljuks. And the Seljuks were fighting them. And they were being defeated badly by the Seljuks of the time. And they felt the pressure. The rest of Europe was under the authority of the Pope, the Catholic Pope, centered in Rome. But things were not good. The Roman, the, the French are fighting the British, the Germans. You know how the situation in Europe was. And what happened that changed things? As I said, when the Seljuks were fighting against the Orthodox Christians, and as they felt that they're defeated, they sent to the Pope, we need some soldiers, help us out. The Pope at this time, Urban II, came with the idea, if you will, of the Crusades. The idea of the Crusades came when he watched what was happening to the Muslims. Far off in Andalusia, far off in the western parts of the land of Islam, the city of Toledo, Tulaytila, Toledo fell in the hands of the, uh, the, the crusaders there. The islands of Sicily fell to the Normans. And you can see what is going on in the eastern districts of the, the Muslim world, whether it be Sham and Baghdad and Egypt, Muslims were not in a good shape. And the Pope used this opportunity that the Orthodox Christians are asking for help. And he ordered um, in Clermont, the city of France, if you will, a huge conference. And you can search it out and find the exact text of his famous speech that he gave. And he gave a speech. In this speech, quickly, things that he mentioned, that bad news are coming from the city of Jerusalem, the city of the Prince of Peace, Jesus, peace be upon him. And he said, a cursed nation, referring to Muslims, an unclean race, again referring to Muslims, took power. And he started saying that Muslims are killing Christians left and right and they're de destroying churches and burning them, which is completely untrue. That was not the case. And he, of course, people got so much affected. And one of the things that happened in Christianity, it is wrong to kill. Killing is not allowed. The Christians tell you it's all about love. How can you kill? But he came up with the idea that killing Muslims is not a bad thing. It's actually an act by which one gets closer to God. And he promised everyone that would go on to a crusade to save the city of Jerusalem, he will be permitted to heavens and all his sins will be forgiven. And he spoke to them, especially the, the, the Franks in, in, in France, and they got so excited. And a massive crusade started to, to form and 
people started flocking left and right by the thousands for the call to save the city of Prince of Peace. Meanwhile, what was going on in Sham? The, the children of the Seljuk leader that died, they were fighting among each other, each city alone. If you read history, and I won't go through the details, fights every year, fight a Muslim against his own brother. And a massive crusader campaign started to form. The first, the crusade started landing, and they landed in Asia Minor. They went all the way to the Orthodox Empire, and then they started landing in Asia Minor. When they landed there, their first encounter was the Sultan that had Asia Minor. Now remember what we said, that they split. Asia Minor was under a figure called Qilj or Salan. And he, at this time, when, when the Crusaders landed, he was busy with another leader doing what? Fighting. They were fighting another one. And he was so much into it. He had this alliance and finally they, they're, they're going to win. And he was looking forward to take his share. And news come to him that, you know what? News of a, a crusade, soldiers landed and they're on the way to your capital, the city of Nicaea. And he was, okay, I'm used to the Byzantine or like the, the Orthodox Christians. Later, later, let me, I can't leave now. If I leave, my, my partner will take my share. And then he, what should I do? Should I return? Should I stay? He stayed. And then news come to him. They are surrounding your capital, the city of Nicaea. You have to leave. He goes, makes a deal with, the, forced to leave. He goes and makes a deal with this uh, partner of his and leaves and runs to the city of Nicaea. And as he arrives, he was shocked. He didn't expect it. Hundreds of thousands of well-equipped soldiers and they completely surrounded the city of Nicaea. He attempts to make an attack, but at no use. He feels it's hopeless. So he gives his command and order. Surrender the city of Nicaea, but surrender it to the Orthodox Christians, for we know them. They were more civilized. And indeed, next day, the city of Nicaea is given to the Orthodox Christians. And then he turns back to his partner and he tells him, you know what? We have to form an alliance. They're coming. And of course, you can tell, you're next. You have to help me out. We have to make an ambush for them. Let's fight them. And in, indeed, they go. And by the way, the Seljuks were... were famous for one technique at the time. They were excellent horsemen and they were excellent in the use of the bow and arrow. And they used to shoot thousands of bow and arrow. And not only that, they used to ride their horse, go down, and then while riding, aim and shoot to a deadly accuracy. And their method was to use this technique. Wave after wave of horsemen will ride and then thousands of arrows will be fired. And then they would decimate the army opponents. So they used this, they laid an ambush. And they waited for the crusader army to come. And indeed, after a while, they saw the crusader army started appearing. And it went in. And they give their orders, you know, fire the arrows. And even today's modern day con contemporaries and scholars, they wonder how did they fire arrows that far? And by the way, one, one theory they have, they had a special bow and arrow. You know the bow and arrow? They had a huge bow and arrow that a person would actually lay on his back, put his feet on the bow, and then pull... You know, the string with the arrow all the way and lay completely flat and then fires. And that would launch the arrow for miles and they used thousands of those. So they launched thousands of arrows and it is said the attack was so effective against the foot soldiers of the crusaders. But soon, something unexpected happened to them. You know how the European knights are. Anyone who knows the medieval European knight, it's a fortress of iron. Iron from head to toe. The horse is a fortress of iron. So the arrows did nothing. And they say that, yes, they, they, they were very sluggish, very slow in their movement, but they keep formation and they stay together and you shoot thousands of arrows, nothing happens. And they started, now what should we do? The, the, the knights, we launched arrows, nothing happened. The element of surprise is lost. Now they know that we're there. They grouped, they made a formation. Let's attack. Should we attack? Should we engage in hand combat against them? No, yes, they, they, they were scared from this European medieval knight, what should we do with them? And as they're speaking, the surprise happened. What they were attacking, what they thought to be the crusader army was only the vanguard of the, of the true army. And they look and all of a sudden, thousands of soldiers start appearing. The true army appeared. They started retreating to the other side. And all of a sudden they look, another army started appearing, thousands. They look on their back, a third army started and they realize they are surrounded with hundreds of thousands of those crusaders. At this point, what happened? 
one advantage they had. Qilj Arsalan, one advantage, that their horses are light. They have light horses, speed, run, run for your life. So he took the horses, the horsemen ran quickly. They can't, they can't run as fast as we. But what about the foot soldiers? They can't run. Every man for himself. He left all the foot soldiers. The horsemen ran. Qilj Arsalan and whoever ran for their lives. The foot soldiers, it is said, they were massacred. It was a complete massacre. But as he runs, the worst part is he spreads the news. And that's the real defeat. Defeat is not a military defeat when we are defeated internally. He's, the news spread about a formidable army, knights, fortress of iron, undefeatable, strong. And the news started spreading around. And as such, the army of the crusaders started marching. They marched directly to one of the biggest cities in Asia Minor, the city of Anitok. The city of Anitok, or Antakya in, in Arabic, the city of Anitok. What was the situation there? And that I will go into a little bit because it will give you a glimpse of how things are. There are lessons to be learned from that. The city of Anitok, the, the leader of the city of Anitok was involved in what I call the war of the two brothers. What is the war of the two brothers? Well, in Shem, there are actually three major cities in the area of Shem that we will focus on. The capital, which is Damascus, the city of Halab or Aleppo, and the city of Mosul. Well, what happened is the following. What, after, remember we said, after the Seljuk uh, ruler died, his, uh, his kingdom splits and like it is five different parts. What happened is the following. One of his sons called Rudwan that appeared in Aleppo, he started killing all his brothers so that he would, he would have control for himself. One of his brothers succeeded in his escaping. His name is Daqaq and he escaped all the way to Damascus. And now you had those two characters, the two brothers, Ridwan in Aleppo and Daqaq in Damascus. Those two were continuously fighting. Ridwan was under the influence of the Ismailis. He completely fell under their influence. He believed in them. The Ismaili madhab started spreading. The assassins had strong grip of Aleppo. And that was why people were scared from Ridwan. If you would go against him, maybe the assassins would kill you. And oftentimes you would see the two figures, Ridwan and the Qaq, fighting together. The year before this, before the arrival of the crusaders, the leader of Anitok went. And what he did, he formed an alliance with Ridwan. And he attacked the Qaq with him, Damascus. But the attack failed. On the way back, guess what happened? He switched allegiance. He told the Qaq, this ruler of Damascus, well, Ridwan is, is going back to Aleppo. Let's form another you know, group and let's attack him. And they did that. They, they grouped together and attacked him. But the attack failed. So now, when the crusaders are coming, what will this leader of Anitak do? He needs help. They started coming and they surrounded the city of Antakya. And he saw the armies, thousands, and he's, the city is strong, but how long can he hold? He needs help. So he sends and he chooses, you know what? I, I, I can't send for, for Ridwan. I mean, we have these differences. So he sent to the Qaq, the one in Damascus. And he tells him, please help me. And you know, of course, the politics involved, you know, if they take my city, maybe you're going to be next. I know, let's, let's group together. And the major concern of the Qaq, this leader of Damascus, was the following. If I help you, it means my army leaves Damascus, right? Guarantee for me that this leader of, of Aleppo, Ridwan, won't attack. And while I'm helping you, he will take the city. And you can see again, where is the focus and where is the concern of everyone? What is more important, my own seat? or the benefits of the Muslims. For them, that was a major thing. So after a long political discourse, he finally agreed, and he, he wants to end this as soon as possible. So he sends his army, and on the way, they meet a small outpost of the Crusader army. They take this outpost by surprise, and it was a good opportunity. But the Qaq, so afraid, so scared, he orders his soldiers, don't attack. Maybe they will go away. But on the contrary, this small group of the Crusaders they went ahead and attacked the Qaq. When that happened, he was badly defeated. defeated. And that was it. No, no, no need to convince him anymore. It is back again to Damascus. Ma'assalama, yeah, khalas, done. You go, you deal with it by yourself. I'm done. And he goes back. Now the leader of Anitok is left with one choice. He has to go to Aleppo. He has to go to Ridwan. And you can imagine, he goes there 
Of course, apologies, you know, and why did you go for the Qaq and apology and I was wrong and you can guess the long political discourse that happened till finally Ridwan agrees, you know, I will help you. But the same story, he sends an army with him and now they're scared from those knights. So he orders his army to go into valleys between kind of mountains unnoticed. And what happened is as they go in a narrow valley between two mountains, it was an ambush and the crusaders attacked them. They were ambushed. And it was said this army, although it was not small in number, again, you can see, you can see here the state of Muslims from inside. They got badly defeated. And then Ridwan retreated and left everything and went back to his city. Now, this leader of Anitok is left with no one. Next day, Anitok, they hear the crusaders laughing and the catapults firing, whistles of catapults, and the laughters of the crusaders outside. What was going on? You know what they were firing? The heads, the limbs of the army of Aleppo. The army that you think is going to help you? Here they are. They started firing that inside the city and people were terrorized. But they did even one more thing. They caught one of the men of, of Anitok, a spy that was among them to, you know, to get the news. They caught him. So what did they do? They took him in front of the walls. They beheaded him. But then they roasted him and ate him in front of everyone. If anybody does that, that will be his fate. The Knights of Europe, that's the reality. People were terrorized in Anitok completely. And there was one choice left. He has to go to the third city of shame, remember al Mausul, And he goes there, distressed, and the news of the two defeats reach there. And the, the character or the leader there called Karboga, how, how come? And he, he, of course, again, you can see, we have to fight, and he starts doing what? We have to all group together and fight together. And he sends to Baghdad, he sends to Ridwan, he sends to Daqaq, let's make an army, a joint army. We have to save, you know, the city. And the thing, it's under his power. It was a good opportunity for him to put himself in charge. Good opportunity to achieve a victory, if you will. As they were doing this, something unexpected happened. A small group of the crusaders left the, the, the siege of Anitok. Where were they heading? They were heading to a city called Arroha or Edisa. This city is ruled by the uh, Orthodox Armenians. And when they realize that the crusaders are here, they're Christians. So the king sent to them, why don't you come? Let's form an uh, allegiance. You can come and you can come and you can help me, you know, defend my city. And I'll be like your father. And indeed, they sent a group of crusaders in the city. And they made a big ceremony that this is now my son, you know, and I'm his father and everything. The next day, the crusaders killed the king. They killed the orthodox Christian king and his wife. And they took control of the city and the principle of Edisa. And that was the first kingdom of theirs, theirs that they established in the lands of Islam. When the news arrived, now this leader Karboga is like, where should we go? Everyone told him, go to Anitok. They are under siege. They can't wait. The city will fall. He said, no, we can't leave Arroha. We can't leave this Edisa principle. We have to attack them there. They warned him, it will take weeks. This will take, it will drag. But he listens to no one. He takes control. He was a little bit arrogant, if you will. And actually people hated his, his way of control. Very demanding, very arrogant. Doesn't listen. He took the army. He went to Edisa, started trying to recapture the city. But things, a week passed, two weeks passed. The crusaders are really fighting and no success. And at this point he says, okay, let's go back. Let's take the army. Let's go back to Anitok. Little does he know. On the way back, as he, as he reaches Anitok, the city already fell to the crusaders. When Anitok fell to the crusaders, and you can read that by their own history, what happened? A massive massacre. The crusaders went inside. Every man, every woman, every child. They killed everyone. But then the crusaders realized that the, this new army came thousands and they started surrounding Anitok. What happened? And I'll go a little bit faster here. Eventually, the crusaders give them, we are going to come out to meet you. We'll open the doors. Let us come out so we, we can finally fight. Now, the leader, the Karboga says, yes, you know, let's, let's get this done. Let them come out. Let them form and let's fight and take them all over. But then his followers were not happy. They started differing. No, you cannot let them out. And then, remember the Qaq and Ridwan? They realized this is too dangerous. If Karboga wins this battle, that's going to be really bad. And then, and look at this. 
which is worse? If the, the Crusaders took Anitok, well, the Crusaders is one more power. But if Carboga succeeds in taking the city of Anitok and defeats the Crusaders, we will be next. It is better in our own interest to allow this new power to stay. It is better if he gets defeated. And they make an alliance. And once the Crusaders start to attack, both Ridwan and Daqaq, the city of Damascus and Alipu, the army start deserting and leaving. And the Muslims couldn't stand the attack of the Crusaders. They start retreating. The huge army, the Muslim army that formed, got badly defeated, defeated in the Battle of Anitok. And Karboga retreats. Massive defeat. And as such, there is nobody now left to check the advance of the Crusaders. They immediately head. And before going to Jerusalem, I'll mention just one city. And I think it's important. What happened in the city of Maharra. Now people are scared from those knights of Europe. They approach the city of Maharra, and people inside, uh, they're scared. How are we going to resist? And then they try to make a deal. If we give you the city, what happens? And they tell them, indeed, if you surrender the city, if you choose to surrender, you will be safe. If we take the city, we, uh, you will be allowed to go out in safety. And they agree. They make a deal. Once the crusaders went in the city, guess what happened? The deal was violated. They started killing again the same way. Men, women and children, but something worse happened in the city of Ma'arra. By their own account, not by the Muslim account. They said the following, and they sent this letter to the Pope. They said that in the city of Ma'arra, we boiled the adult of the infidels in pots. As for their kids, we paled them on spits of fire. You know shish kebab? And they, we devoured their flesh. Cannibalism. They ate Muslims. This is by their own account. And you can tell, when this happened, Muslims were not used to this. People were terrified. Who's next? Those, those are, they're cannibals. They're eating. We cannot resist them. At this point, all the cities were scared. Which city will be next? Shem has lots of, lots of cities. cities. Where are they going to go? Then the news come. Finally, we know where they're heading. Their destination is Jerusalem. Guess what happens next? The rulers of all the cities of Shem, whether it be Beirut, Akka, Tripoli, all the cities, they start doing what? Alhamdulillah. All what they're heading for is what? Jerusalem. So what should we do? Let's form an alliance. So they send to the crusaders and they send them telling them what? Yeah, all what you want is Jerusalem, right? Here is some gold. You don't have food. Here is some food. You don't have mounts. Here are some mounts. Here is some wine. Here are some guides to show you the way to Jerusalem. As long as I'm okay sitting on my seat, it doesn't matter. That reminds me of a modern day reality, isn't it? As long as my seat is okay, as long as it's not my country, I don't care. Pass. Pass. That's what they did. They helped the crusaders out. And indeed, the crusade reached the city of Jerusalem. And by the way, one thing to mention, while they were at Anitok, what about the Ismailis in Egypt? What were they doing? You know what happened? Once the crusaders took the city of Anitok, an ambassador came from the Ismailis in Egypt. They did two things. An ambassador was sent to Anitok. Congratulations that you took the city of Anitok. Let's have a deal. You have Shem and we have Egypt. That they wanted to make a deal with them. But at the same time, they use the opportunity. The Seljuks are busy fighting the Crusaders, right? It's a good opportunity for an attack. So they sent an army from Egypt. They sent their army and they took the city of Jerusalem into their control. So the city of Jerusalem at this time was under the Egyptian Ismailis' control. So when they sent the message to the, to the Crusaders in Anitok, the response came back. Basically, their message was clear. You take all the area of Shem, great. We take Egypt, we're happy. The response from the Crusaders was one thing. What about Jerusalem? And the Egyptians tried to reply something that reminds me of today. You know what? Okay, we have Egypt. You have Shem. Uh, Jerusalem, we, uh, how about making it an international no army zone? And this, of course, are modern words. Like, we, we rule it together. You know, let, let's come to a deal regarding Jerusalem. Something uh, that reminds me of today again. The response of the Crusaders was one line. We are marching to Jerusalem and our lands are up high. No, Jerusalem is ours. And indeed, they started to reach Jerusalem. At this point, 
the, the Ismaili Khalifa leaves the garrison of Jerusalem alone. His army is in, in another outpost and he leaves them to, to, to their fate. And the crusaders indeed surround the city of Jerusalem. And of course you can guess what happened. They started building huge siege engines. And after 40 days, the, the walls of the city, they were breached. When the city was breached and the crusaders went inside, inside Jerusalem, remember, the city of the Prince of Peace, the city of Jesus, the one that preaches, according to the Pope, love, right? Right? Christianity is love. And Muslims, we're the barbarians. Remember Urban II? Remember what he said? Look at what's going on. Look at history speaks differently. And once they entered in, what happened? They started a wide range of massacre again. And then the Muslims scared. They gathered inside the Aqsa Mosque. They say between 30,000 to 70,000 Muslim, 70, Muslims inside the Aqsa Mosque. What did the Crusaders do? They went inside. The Knights of Europe. Chivalry, right? When you speak about Knights, what do you think of? They tell us Knights means chivalry. Untrue. History speaks different. Barbarians. If anything, the concept of chivalry actually, as we'll show, was learned from Muslims of the time, as we'll see. But the history speaks of the knights. Yes, yes, they were strong. Yes, they had determination. They were barbarians. They entered and they say by their own account, not by the Muslim account, their own account. They tell you they started killing Muslims and they say we killed the infidels in Haikal Sulaiman. You know, they, we killed the infidels in the temple of Solomon, which is referring to the Aqsa Mosque, until their blood was all the way to the knees of our horses and body parts were floating. Our knights had to stop killing because the smell, the stench was so bad, they could not take it anymore. They had to stop killing the Muslims over there. All the Muslims, the 30,000 in the Aqsa Mosque, they were all massacred. The Jews, what happened to them? Jews? Yeah, there were Jews in Jerusalem at the time, living with the Muslims in peace. What happened to them? They ran into their synagogue. So what do the knights do? The knights of Europe again. They blocked the doors of the synagogues. And they burned the Jews inside all alive. They didn't spare even the Orthodox Christians. They too suffered at the hands of the Knights of Europe. And for the next week, consistent killing of everyone in Jerusalem. For one week, killing of Muslims. Again, babies, they used to take them, their heads would be smashed on stones. Again, something that reminds me of today. That's what they did. The Aqsa Mosque. What happened to the Aqsa Mosque? Well, no Adhan. The Aqsa Mosque stayed for 90 years. Today, is there Adhan in the Aqsa Mosque? At that day, for a century, the Aqsa Mosque had no Adhan. The Aqsa Mosque, they converted a part of it. They made it a stable. Can you imagine? Horses and, of course, the urine and, you know, the Aqsa Mosque is a stable. A part of it is storage. A part of it is a place for them to sleep. They said they destroyed the Masjid of Omar as well. That's what they did. And the, the few people that were left, they had to face their fate. What? Dig a ditch, make a ditch, bury the bodies. And after they did that, they killed them and threw them with them. Everyone was killed. Very few people succeeded in escaping. Of the people that actually succeeded of leaving was the Qadi of Jerusalem, Al-Harawi, the judge. And with him and his group was the original Mus'haf of Uthman. The Khalifa, you know the original compilation of the Qur'an, Alhamdulillah, Muslims succeeded in taking that with them. And he headed where? His direction was, he's heading to Baghdad, directly to the Khalifa, to, to seek help and tell him what happened in Jerusalem. And once he reached Baghdad, interestingly enough, he shaved, he shaved his head and he was a traveler and it was the month of Ramadan. He starts eating in front of everyone. And people were, what? A person eating in public in Ramadan? Guards, you know, soldiers. And they started gathering around him. As they did that, he told them, you're angry, you're upset because I violated the sanction of Ramadan. Do you know what happened in Jerusalem? The sanction of Jerusalem, the sanction of Al-Aqsa, 30,000, 70. And he started telling them of what happened. He said everyone cried. Everyone went to the, the castle of the Khalifa. He enters and he starts again. This is a judge, very eloquent with poetry and, and speaks about what happened. Everyone was in tears. The Khalifa, the soldiers, and what you can guess what happened. The call for jihad, we have to fight. Massive demonstrations. Massive demonstrations all over Baghdad. And again, it reminds me of something we do today. Massive demonstrations. 
about like we have to fight but guess what happened nothing happened it reminds me of today's reality something i called the coca-cola muslim you know that you know you know the bottle of coke or the coke tin if you shake it what happens and you open it yeah it, it it comes out and it creates a lot of mess but at the end of the day it's just coke it's nothing we are like that they were like that at this time they get angry and upset and massive demons maybe they burned flags too did they i don't know <laughs> anyway they get angry and upset but at the end of the day nothing happened and jerusalem was left egypt well he sent an army but he got badly defeated this and he left and the fate of jerusalem was left to the crusaders but finally all the cities that helped remember beirut tripoli and here is a lesson what do you think they did next all the cities that helped them one by one they were attacked Akka, for example was attacked by the crusaders and they sent to them peace let us out of the city and they agreed we'll let you out we'll let you out with your wealth if you deliver the city and they made an agreement as they're going out the crusaders violate the agreement they take everything and kill everyone the city of Akka falls over the next 10 years you can see what happened an expansion of the crusaders eventually all the coast all the area of lebanon all the coastal cities fall to the crusaders and as such kingdoms are established the kingdoms of the crusaders four different kingdoms if you will the kingdom of edisa the first one that fell the anitok the second one and then the kingdom of jerusalem and the kingdom of tripoli what will happen next where is hope how will things change that's inshallah what we'll see next time.